All right. So in the previous uh, class, we were talking about the Bode plot of first order and second order system, and we wanted to juxtapose the time response, sorry, the impulse response and the step response of first order system with the frequency response of the system or rather Bode plot of the system. And we were doing the same thing for the second order system. So what I'm going to do in today's class, we are going to go through a lot of different Bode plots for different types of uh, continuous time and discrete time system. So we'll just do a recap of what we did in the previous class, and then we will continue the discussion for today's class. And uh, the Bode plots, all the plots that I'm going to talk about in today's lecture, they are all uploaded to Carmen as lecture 24.pdf. So I'll probably upload the OneNote file because the PDF things are slightly broken. So I'll upload the PDF, uh, sorry, the OneNote file as well. So you will have access to all these figures. So you don't really have to draw it, um, uh, you know, while I speak. So this was the, uh, this is the impulse response of the first order system. This is the step response of the first order system. This is the Bode plot, the Bode magnitude plot and the Bode phase plot of the first order system. So one of the things we realized is uh, this is tau is the time constant uh, for this first order system. Uh, tau actually is, if I remember, it is tau h of j omega one over tau j omega plus one or tau dy over dt plus yt equals to xt. That was the, this is the differential equation the time domain equation for the system. This is the frequency domain equation for the system or the frequency response of the system. And so you can observe that if you look at the Bode plot, uh, the point at which the omega at which you, uh, so if when omega is one over tau, you see that the frequency response of the system is minus three dB. Okay, so by looking at the frequency response of the system and by looking at where exactly minus three dB point is in the frequency response, you can infer what the one over tau for the system is from which you can infer what tau for, for the system is going to be and how long the system is going to take to reach the steady state, like to approximately reach the steady state value. So three tau is typically the what is used in control systems. And if you are, so after three tau, you are pretty much close to the steady state of the system. So by looking at the frequency plot, so, okay. So the other important thing to notice is this pi over four also, like if you look at the phase plot and you look at where exactly the phase plot crosses the pi over four line, minus pi over four line. So minus 45 degree line, that is also uh, the frequency uh, where that is the frequency of one over tau. So again, by looking at uh, the phase plot, you can infer what the value of tau is. And from that, you can infer how quickly the system is going to get to the steady state value uh, in the time given in the case of uh, step response. Okay, so this is something we had discussed in the previous class in uh, quite a bit of detail. Now, any question on this before we jump on to the second order system? Okay. So the second order system case was somewhat interesting. Uh, we have two different parameters, zeta and omega n, and the frequency response is given by omega n square. So this is what my frequency response of the system is. This is the impulse response. This is the step response. And what we had predicted in the previous class is when zeta is between zero and one, then we have oscillations then zeta is greater than equal to one. Sorry, let me just make it strictly less than one. 
So when zeta is greater than or equal to one, then there are no oscillations. Okay, and we can see that in these uh, in these figures. So this is zeta 0 0.1 to 0 0.7, and you see the oscillations going up and down. So it goes above the x-axis, then it remains below the x-axis for some time, then it goes above the x-axis for some time, and so on. So that's those are the oscillations. So the impulse response has oscillations. The step response has oscillations. Um, now, now in the time domain, we are seeing oscillations for zeta less than one. We are not seeing any oscillations for zeta greater than one. Can we infer something similar by looking at the um, frequency plot? So can we look at the frequency plot or the Bode plot? And can we infer whether there will be oscillations in the system or not. Let's try to think about it. Okay, so question is, can we predict oscillations in time domain by looking at body plot? Okay, so that's the question. So anything specific? Uh, so what do you notice in the body plot for values of zeta less than one and for values of zeta greater than one? Anything uh, surprising that you notice? Anyone notices? Uh, the ones that are less than one are above the um, negative three decibel. Right. Right, so when zeta is less than one, which is when oscillations happen in the time domain, when zeta is less than one, then you see a bump in the, in the magnitude plot of the Bode plot, right? So it goes above, this is the zero dB line, this is the zero dB line, goes above the zero dB line, the magnitude plot, and then it has an asymptotic slope of minus 40 dB per decade. Okay, so by looking at a kink in the magnitude plot, I can predict that my zeta is less than one or not. And if zeta is less than one, then for sure in the step response, I'm going to see uh, uh, some sort of oscillation, stamped oscillations. Now, if this kink is very large, the oscillations are going to be very large. So let's let's look at it. So this kink is for the highest kink we have is for zeta equals 0 0.1. For zeta equals 0 0.1, we see that this oscillations are pretty pronounced, right? And as we increase the value of zeta, so in zeta equals 0 0.4, you see the kink is actually very small and for zeta equals to 0 0.4, the oscillations are also very small. So these are the oscillations that we are seeing. This is the, this is the graph for zeta equals 0 0.4, and we see that the oscillations are pretty small for that value of zeta. Okay, so by looking at the peak, of the magnitude plot, we can infer whether zeta is less than one or greater than one. And based on that, we can predict that there will be oscillations in the frequency response, eh, sorry, in the, in the step response. Now, what about, what about the natural frequency? So these, this frequency, um, so how much time it takes for one entire oscillation? So let's, let's see. This is, this is my one line and starting from here to here is one particular uh, full cycle of oscillation. And it turns out that this particular oscillation is proportional to omega n. So how do we get an information about what value of omega n is for this particular system? So now again, look at the body plot and can someone point out 
what happens at omega n? Can we infer the value of omega n by looking at the Bode plot? Would it just be where that curve happens or would it be the minus three decibels? Uh, so you're looking only at the magnitude plot. Why don't you look at the phase plot as well? You're kind of right, but not quite. So I'll get to it in a bit. But when you look at the phase plot, do you see something specific happening at omega n? That's where all the, um, the values connect. Right, so that's exactly equal to minus pi over two at value of omega n. So again, by looking at the frequency response of the system and by looking at the phase plot, where the phase, at, phase plot uh, intersects the minus pi over two line, that's where the value of omega n is. That's where omega, that is the way to infer the value of omega n from the frequency response. Okay, so by looking at the magnitude plot, I can infer the value of zeta. By looking at the phase plot, I can infer the value of omega n. And those are the only two variables that describe the frequency response of the system. Okay, omega n and zeta. So in other words, by looking at the Bode plot, I can actually identify the system exactly because I can identify the value of zeta and I can identify the value of omega n through the plots. Now, somebody mentioned about this, where this kink happens. It seems to be close to omega n, but it's not exactly omega n. So I want to give you the point at, at which this max happens. So, We draw a gray line. So this will be, let me call this omega max. So this is the point at which the magnitude plot is, reaches the maximum value. And by doing some calculus, which I'm sure you know how to compute the maximum of a curve. So by doing some calculus, you can show that omega max is actually equal to omega n square root one minus two zeta square. And the absolute value of h omega max is one over two zeta square root one minus zeta square. So I'm not going to derive these values uh, in the class, but uh, in if you take 3551, you will actually derive it in the class or at least uh, it'll be one of the homework assignments to derive these values. It just follows from taking the derivative of 20 log base 10 h of j omega and setting the first derivative with respect to omega equal to zero and then solving for that equation, which is a horrible e equation, but it can be solved. Now, the other thing I wanted to um, tell you is this, this frequency at which you see these oscillations. So the frequency of oscillation is typically denoted by omega d, the damped damped frequency and this is omega n square root one minus zeta square. Which again, you you take the, you compute the impulse, uh, the, sorry, the step response, and you will see that this is what the frequency of oscillations are going to be. Okay, so you can actually infer the entire time behavior uh, of step response or impulse response by just looking at the Bode plot or vice versa. If you know the time response, you will know exactly what the Bode plot looks like. If you know the Bode plot, you can figure out what the time uh, 
the step response is going to look like or impulse response is going to look like. Okay, so now look, let's look at situations where your zeta is less than one and therefore you see some sort of oscillations in the system. Okay, I'm gonna show you some YouTube videos. Any questions so far on this theoretical part before I move on to YouTube? Okay. So let's look at earthquake. So in earthquake, the ground shakes and you can see in the video that the buildings are moving because of the shaking in the ground. So you can imagine that you have a, either an impulse input, if it just shakes once and then after that it stops, or you have some sort of periodic input if it is just uh, the ground is shaking uh, left, right and center because of the earthquake, because of an ongoing earthquake in which case all of these buildings, there are like 60 or 70 buildings, all of which are swinging. Uh, and that's because Zeta is less than one. So that's why you, you observe the swinging behavior in the system because of an impulse response or a step input. Okay, so that's, uh, that's in the building case. Uh, it also happens when the wind is blowing. So it's not just, this is an earthquake, uh, video but uh, even if you look at uh, buildings tall buildings or tall churches churches that were built in 1600s or 1700s but they were very tall and if if the wind is very high then those churches are actually swinging and i have been to one such church uh, i think in copenhagen um, about 10 years ago and uh, and 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 i was standing at the top of the church and that building was basically shaking it was a very scary experience uh, but but the building has been around for 400 years, so I can't complain. Now, that's the building case. Let's look at the bridge case. I know you have seen this video before. Uh, this is also an oscillation that is not damped. So your zeta is strictly less than one. And because of the wind, so the wind is injecting energy. Wind is in giving a either impulse input or an impulse strain or a step input to this particular system and it leads to oscillations. And of course, in this case, things don't go well and the, uh, the bridge ended up collapsing completely and it, uh, it collapsed. This is a 1940 video. So that's when this bridge collapsed within three months of construction. So these are the cases where your Zeta is less than one, your zeta is less than one. And it leads to undesirable behavior. Oh, there is another video I wanted to show you. Ah, this video. So here is a car with a bad suspension system. Uh, this mechanic is giving an impulse train input Let's look at the impulse train again. This is an impulse train. It's giving an impulse train input to this particular vehicle and you see these oscillations. Now, typically if you have a good vehicle, I mean, this guy is basically selling a better suspension system. So if you have a good suspension system, you won't see such oscillatory behavior. But if your suspension system has gone bad, then you will see such oscillatory behavior in your vehicle and it's not, a fun, it's not fun to ride such vehicles. So that's also the case where a good suspension system will have higher values of zeta, maybe zeta close to one uh, or zeta close to 0 0.9 or zeta close to 1.1. But in the case of a bad suspension system, uh, if the damper has gone bad, then the zeta will go down significantly. Uh, and then you will see oscillatory behavior whenever you hit a road bump or whenever you hit a pothole or something like that. So those are the situations where lower values of zeta actually creates a lot of problem. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. 
okay so another reason why uh, bodhi plot is really a fascinating plot is because of the following reason so let's say this is 1920s and uh, you have a complicated system like a telecommunication line which is 100 miles long and has a lot of electromagnetic interferences in between and all that stuff now you want to understand what's the model for this telecommunication system is and you have a lot of complex circuitry complex machinery in between you know wires and what not and it's very difficult for you to do a mathematical modeling you can't sit down and then model the whole system piece by piece and then look at the whole subsystem and composition of subsystems and figure out what the behavior of the system is going to be so the beauty of bodhi plot is for every frequency you give the system an input so you have like a complex system you give it an input a sin omega t you look at the output a absolute value of h of j omega sin omega t plus phi right and you plot this phi in the phase plot you plot this increase in the amplitude in the amplitude plot of the bodhi plot and you do it you repeat this experiment for for a varying values of omega so you start from very small values of omega 0.001 0.01 0.1 one and so on and so forth so you have you have just sweeped across a very large values of omega you have done the testing testing is easy you have oscilloscopes and what not so you can test the you can compute the phase and you can compute the change in amplitude across this complex system and you can plot the bodhi plot and once you have a bodhi plot then you can infer all of this information that we just discussed you can infer all of this information from the from the bodhi plot itself you don't really have to model individual components of the system and try to figure out how the system is going to behave in a certain uh, range of frequencies so that's why bodhi plot was very common in 1920s and 30s and 40s uh, because for complex systems this was an easy way to identify what kind of system you were working with and when you take 3551 this idea will be used to a great extent and uh, you will design controllers for controlling a system based on uh, certain properties of by changing the bodhi plot of the system itself uh, i don't want to get into that but that's something you will spend a lot of time on in 3551 any question so far everyone understands why bodhi plot is important it's because of this reason that you can just do testing rather than modeling to derive some approximation of the system and get some characteristics of the system okay no questions let's talk about discrete time system so we have talked about continuous time first order system continuous time second order system we've studied the bodhi plot now we will talk about discrete time systems and look at the bodhi plot for discrete time systems so let's look at the first order system which is y of n plus minus a y of n minus 1 equals to xn and from this is the state equation we want our a to be strictly less than 1 absolute value of a is strictly less than 1 and we have done the calculation for the impulse well we have done all these calculations so let me just write it previous lectures here is what we know from the previous lecture 
what is h of e raised to j omega? What's the frequency response of this system? Anyone remembers? One over um, e or one minus e j j omega. Right. So that's uh, our frequency response. Uh, our impulse response h of n is a raised to n u n. The step response s n will be h n times u n. And this is given by one minus a raised to n plus one over one minus a u n. So all of this is something we have done in the past. At least the impulse, sorry, the step response is not that difficult to compute. We have done this convolution operation, I think in lecture six or seven. Now, in order to compute the Bode plot, I need to compute the magnitude and I need to compute the phase of the system of H of E raised to J omega of the frequency response of the system. So let's do that. So this is absolute value of one over one minus A e raised to minus j omega. This should be equal to cos of j omega minus j, no, cos of omega minus j sine of omega. So this is equal to one over one minus a cos omega plus a am i right i think i am right So how should I go about computing the amplitude? So it's going to be one in the numerator and I just have to take the absolute value of the denominator. So that's going to be square root of one minus a cos omega square plus a square sine square omega. I don't think I've made any mistakes so far. So let's go ahead. This is actually one plus a square minus two a cos omega square root. And that's my absolute value of h e raised to j omega. Now angle of h e raised to j omega is angle of one over one minus a cos omega plus j a sine omega which is equal to minus tan inverse
Okay, so I have the amplitude curve and I have the phase curve uh, of the frequency response. So let's plot it for various values of A. Any question in this derivation so far? Okay, let's plot it. So this is for A greater than zero and A less than one. So you see uh, for various values of A, A equals to 1.4, one, sorry, one over four, one over two, seven over eight, we have 20 log base 10 of H e raised to J omega, and then the angle plotted in this particular figure. So what do you notice? What do you notice in the, anything, anything peculiar about this uh, amplitude curve? What does it look like? approximately. We are looking at the frequency range of minus pi to pi because, uh, yeah, go ahead. The low pass filter. Low pass filter, right. It looks approximately like a low, low pass filter because the amplitude is pretty high around omega equals zero. This is omega equals zero. So amplitude is pretty high. And then as we move away from omega equals to zero, the amplitude actually goes down uh, all the way until negative pi and all the way until positive pi. So it almost looks like a low pass filter, but it's a causal, it's a causal low pass filter. Because it's, it's a causal system. Now the frequency, sorry, the phase plot also looks, uh, I mean, what, whatever it is. So if you give it a certain frequency, then you will see a phase shift in the, in the output according to this curve. Okay. Now let's, so this is for the case when A is positive and less than one. Let's look at the case when A is negative and greater than minus one. So minus one less than A less than zero. So I have various values of A. This is omega equals zero. And what do we notice here in this case? What sort of filtering behavior are we noticing here? It looks like a high pass filter. Looks like a high pass filter. Right, so this is high frequency, any frequency close to omega. What's wrong? Any frequency that's close to pi and negative pi, those are high frequencies. So it's basically passing high frequencies, but it is attenuating the low frequency. So omega equals to zero, the magnitude plot is small. So it's in a log scale. So anything below zero means it's log. So, so this is the zero, zero line. And so if log of 20 log base 10 H e raised to J omega, if it is less than zero, it means H e raised to J omega is less than one. So it is attenuating those signals. And the phase characteristic looks like in the phase plot. This is the phase plot. Okay, so we studied the body plot of first order system. Um, discrete time system, discrete time first order system. We looked at the case of A greater than zero. We looked at the case of A less than zero. Now let's talk about second order system. Again, a causal system. Just 
discrete time. So the system is y n minus two r cos theta y n minus one Here, zero is less than R is less than one, zero is less than theta is less than equal to pi. This is not a general second order system, it's just a specific class of second order systems. And for this case, can someone tell me what the frequency response looks like? If you remember, I'll just write the expression. It's BK e raised to minus J omega K over summation AK e raised to minus J omega K. If you remember this expression from one of our earlier classes. So BK are the coefficients of XN minus K. AK is the coefficient of YN minus K in this equation. So based on this formula, can someone tell me what the frequency response is going to look like? Okay. Would it be one yeah. over one minus two R cosine theta E to the negative J omega K. Yeah, plus... K is equal to one here. Oh, yeah. you're right. And then plus R squared. Uh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And so this can be written as one minus R e raised to J theta Okay, so then you can use partial fraction. And inverse Fourier transform to get H of N is equal to R raised to N This is for the case theta is not equal to zero. So
Okay, so this is uh, what my impulse response is going to look like after taking the inverse Fourier transform. Let's look at the, uh, the body plot for this particular system. So this is what the body plot looks like for the case of theta equals to zero. In the book they have for various values of theta, I mean, just go and look up figure 6.31. So you will find what happens as you change the value of theta, how does the value of the filter change? And the R values are given here. R equals to one over four, one over two, three over four. So this again, it, it looks like a low pass filter. Because for higher values of frequency, the body plot is below the zero line. So those frequencies are getting attenuated and lower values of frequencies are getting amplified by this particular system. Any questions so far? I hope everyone is clear how we got the board, the frequency response H of E raised to J omega for this. It's uh, using this particular formula. This formula would be a lifesaver in many instances because you can look at the differential equation or the difference equation and you can compute what the frequency response of the system is gonna look like. Once you know the frequency response, you have to factor the denominator, use partial fraction, uh, conduct the inverse Fourier transform, and you get the impulse response of the system, fairly using just simple algebra, no complicated induction, principle of mathematical induction, or particular solution and homogeneous solution required. Okay. Let's look at the discrete time filters. Those are another important class of systems. Moving average filter. And in this case, my Y of N is summation BK xk k equals to minus infinity to plus infinity well k equals to minus n to plus m xn minus k So one of the moving average filters was, so this is of course weighted, there are weights here. Uh, so one of the simplest moving average filter is where you take equal weight. And so the application becomes, the expression becomes N plus M plus one summation k equals minus n to n x n minus k this is of course a non-causal system if m is greater uh, if n is greater than one equal to one then this is non-causal filter Let us look at the 
body plot. Again, you can do the Fourier transform, do all sorts of things uh, we have done so far. And you can get the H of the frequency response, H of E raised to J omega. And then based on that, you can compute the body plot. So let's move directly to the body plots of such filters. This is the moving average filter. Uh, so M plus N plus one equals to 33. This is M plus N plus one equals to 65. So this is what the body plot looks like. Uh, this is just the magnitude curve. There's no phase plot here, uh, just the magnitude plot. So this is the zero dB line. So what do you notice? What kind of filter is this? Low pass? Yeah. Low pass. Yeah. This is also a low pass filter. But the funny thing is that it's low pass, like it's attenuating signals that are just slightly above or below zero, right? So it's attenuating all of these signals and only for a very small uh, section or, or a small uh, frequency range, it basically passes it through with some amplification, but pretty much all other frequencies are attenuated in such a system in this kind of moving average filter. So this is where BK equals to one over N plus M plus one. Now let's try to play around with the value of BK and see if we can come up with a better filter than the moving average filter, right? So BK is a design parameter. I can pick whatever BK I want to pick. Uh, so for a very simple choice of BK, I get some low pass behavior, but I see that it only filters I mean, it filters pretty much all the frequencies except something in a very small range around zero. So here we have another choice of BK, which is sine of two pi K over 33 over pi K for values of K less than equal to 32, absolute value of K less than equal to 32 and it's zero for K greater than 32. So for such a system, this is what the impulse response looks like. As you can see, it's a non-causal impulse response because uh, the value of impulse is non-zero for time n less than zero. So as you can see, this shows the non-causal behavior. Could you really quickly just explain that one more time why it's non-causal there. Right, so any any system whose impulse response is non-zero before time t equals to zero or before n equal to zero, then it's non-causal because it's anticipating what's going to happen in the future. So gotcha, that makes sense. Is not zero for n less than zero. This implies it's non-causal because the system anticipates future input. Perfect, thank you. Sure, uh, thanks for asking this question. Uh, so in this particular case, you see that the impulse response, sorry, the body plot, the magnitude plot is actually pretty cool. Uh, so this is the zero dB line. So at least it's, it's passing frequencies from minus pi over 16 to pi over 16. Right, so, so it, it's, it's attenuating higher frequencies. So these are the higher frequencies that are getting attenuated by this uh, discrete time filter, but there is a range of frequency minus pi over 16 to pi over 16, which it is passing through uh, without much attenuation or with maybe some amplification. So that's a nice property of 
this particular filter. So by changing the values of BK, by changing the value of BK, by playing around with BK, you can actually create a very nice, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, nice low pass filter in this situation. This is also a low pass filter, non-causal filter. Now this opens up a whole new chapter because I can do a lot of different types of, I can pick BK according to some other fashion and I can get a completely different uh, low pass filtering behavior. So there's something called Parks McLennan algorithm. I don't quite know what this algorithm is, but I'm sure you can find a lot of resources online for this algorithm. So for M equals to N equals to 125. So it's a very, very uh, long filter. Um, you can you can come up with, so this algorithm spits out the values of BK, okay? For K going from minus 125 all the way to plus 125. And this is zero, omega equals to zero. This is omega equals to pi. What do you notice in this figure? Do you see a very it's low pass? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It'd be low pass, right? Yeah, it is also a low pass filter, but it has an extremely sharp cutoff. Right. So this is, look at this, this is minus 90, somewhere around minus 90 dB, which means the signal is completely attenuated uh, after this frequency. And up until this frequency, you are pretty much passing the entire signal without much attenuation. It's almost zero dB throughout. So this is an example of coming up with a filter using some sophisticated algorithm you can come up with nice filters that has very, very uh, uh, very very nice cutoff uh, properties that may be desirable in certain applications. Okay, so all in all, we have looked at various uh, frequency response, the, so we have looked at the frequency response of the systems. We have looked at the body plot. We have looked at the time series or rather the impulse response of the system. And we have, uh, this, this particular lecture is trying to capture the essence of the entire discussions we have had so far that by looking at the frequency response, you can infer some properties about the impulse response or step response, which are time series or by looking at the time series, you can infer some information about the frequency response of the system. And, uh, and, and all of this will be more pronounced in some of the later courses that you will be taking um, that are based on signals and systems. So some of these ideas will be then utilized for uh, various applications. So in the EC3551, we do a lot of control design using body plot and using the frequency response of the system approach. So a um, lot of cool things you can do based on whatever we have learned so far in this class. Um, so that's all I have for today. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, bye.